Good evening, primetime partiers. It's primetime party time. Welcome back to our hour of all things media and entertainment, live on the air at 9 p.m. at ptptshow.com and on your time, wherever you stream podcasts. Tonight, we're going to do something wildly different, and I mean wildly different. Uh, We are going to get into a topic that one of our listeners has pitched and actually kind of done a great deep dive into and I am definitely, you know, just taken along for the journey because listeners, I have zero, and I mean zero insights into the wild, wild world of wrestling. So yeah, that's, that's where we begin. At the very beginning, a very good place to start. So Daniel, how are we feeling? How are we feeling about tonight? <laughs> this is exciting because... Uh, this is programming that's like fully primetime programming. Oh, yeah. uh, this is like a Monday night thing. Uh, I, th- I think one of the programs is called Monday Night Raw. I'm yeah, pretty unfamiliar. People tune in. Yeah, it's wildly popular. Us. It's been ongoing for years. It, apparently, there's a rich, deep history to it. Uh, yeah, I just don't. We don't. We don't know it. I've never f- watched a full, you know, hour of of no, this. Not a full minute. No. <laughs> and uh, and so we're not the best people to talk about it which is why we invited a brand new personality to the show uh his name's david taylor and he's a he's a wrestling fan he's a, he's part of the primetime community and he's got a lot to say on it he grew up with it he's very knowledgeable of the subject and the subject surrounding it we'll we'll let him take it away in a bit and uh he's going to take us on kind of like a, a journey to learn about this behemoth of television that we're super unfamiliar with and otherwise would never have covered on primetime party time. No, we're going to have to kind of like go down the rabbit hole and be, you know, taken along for this ride and figure out, you know, what this subsect of primetime party time. (laughs) And Um, it does feel very cult followed. Would we say? Yeah. Or Or is it more beloved? And I'm just so out of it that I'm like, it's niche, and then everyone else is like, "You're niche." This is, <laughs> you know how there's like, uh, I don't mean to make this comparison. You know, you know how there's news, and someone in America, like your neighbor, might be living in one world, and you're living yeah. in a totally different world, getting totally differently skewed stories, and yeah, like yeah you got you just... an NPR neighbor. A BBC neighbor and a Fox News neighbor. And right. They're all kind of like, there's some things that are similar, but many, many things are different. I guess the point is, right? The point is it's demographics. It's it's less that it's like your niche. I think it's just that the divide is so great that not it never audience. crosses over. You're not the target audience and Absolutely it never crosses not. over. It never tries to market to you. Uh, and I feel like this is like something where like, if you're already into sports, like watching sports, yeah, it's kind of like a easy next step, right? Yeah, it, it's it's weird because it's like this mix of a bunch of stuff that doesn't come from the storytelling world, and it's like it's ended up crafting a story out of it. The thing is, I did watch that animated cartoon that was about Lucha Libre on Cartoon Network. Oh yeah, Mucha Lucha, I remember that. It's honestly kind of cute. The animation looks like a similar ish style to like it's not as like unoutlined as like the fosters for imaginary friends but it does kind of like have a little more like whimsy it feels very on brand for the podcast how do you know about it a children's cartoon from <clears throat> late 90s <laughs> i was not reached there's so many things that i learned through just even brief excerpts of this interview that i was like i had no idea so you know what let's let's get into it let's let's see what david has to tell us i am david taylor i basically I grew up uh, watching pro wrestling uh, from the point of uh, middle school, right during that, uh, what what many consider the peak point of wrestling when it comes to American wrestling. Uh, I've come here to 
talk about my experience with wrestling, uh, even a little bit into my own uh, backyard wrestling when, you know, I was but a, a dumb youth, uh, you know. <laughs> How would you describe what pro wrestling actually is? Oh, I would honestly say hmm, it's a unique experience, honestly, it, it, because... It's part true time sport when it comes down to it. It comes down to the physical injuries when it comes down to the CTE. A lot of people suffer from it. Uh, a lot of scars and a lot of everything because they do it day in, day out. And there's a lot of physical injuries, painkillers. So it, it's a weird mix of being part of like a television program and like a show, but also like an athlete at the same time. Did these start mm -hmm. as actual sports leagues, or were they always meant to be fictional entertainment? Oh, it was always meant to be fictional entertainment. It's usually a perfect reflection of the sign of the times. Any characters they come out with is either based on whatever topics are going around, or whomever the enemy at that point in time is. Like the biggest heels in the '80s all revolved around like the Soviet Union and the Middle East, and whomever was uh, quote unquote, you know the people that Amer were the enemies of America. And then the 90s kind of had that whole the anti-hero theme where, you know, everything was against the establishment one way or another, you know. But that uh, that whole grunge thing, the whole grunge feeling of just anti-establishment, uh, the anti-hero, basically being part of that extreme part of the 90s. Extreme meets I don't care meets whole bunch of little things in there basically the motivation is to get that championship or for like uh or whatever your championship is supposed to be like the intercontinental or your tag team the goal of wrestling when they do it more like a choreography is to make it look like it hurts but do not hurt at all because when it comes down to the whole wrestling a lot of like what the moves are and what everything is isn't uh, they'll they'll go through a general thing of what will happen in the match, but the the specific rules or what's going to happen is between the two wrestlers. I'm going to do this, and then it'll whisper it between when they're locking up or when they're about to hit somebody. They'll give a sign of dislike, suplex. They'll give a sign of that. That way, they know to go back to, and then to be able to catch him to be able to do it right. It's a whole little art, and if you really do it wrong, you could really mess up somebody's health and everything, too. It was a Ric Flair book. He's like one of the old, uh, one of the most respected men in the industry when it comes to wrestling. And his book often talked a lot about that, too. How it would just, uh, some guys could just do a whole show, and it would be theatrical, and he would be able to sell. And what they mean by sell is uh, basically get hit or get a move done with on you and be able to sell the damage like you get the hit and then you react to the point to where it's just like oh you actually got hit or you know when you got like slammed down you get jump up and then you walk forward and then that that was a classic uh, rick flair one was like he would get knocked down he'd walk up and he stumbled forward and then he would just fall down flat on his face uh, that would be like the classic sell of a move Wrestling isn't traditionally filmed at some studio. It's like a traveling mm. circus, right? Yeah, yeah. That's that's uh, kind of where the P.T. Barnum aspect comes from it, too. Historically speaking, that's that's actually uh, where wrestling spread from. It would be from going down to town, city to city, you know, state to state, through Canada, through Mexico, through Europe. I mean, hell, damn near everywhere. They, that's uh, basically how they spread the word. That's how it kind of inspired other spots to do so. And it inspired its own unique brand in wrestling when it came to it, too. Especially in Mexico. In, like, America and Canadian wrestling essentially are the same. Well, differences here and there, but a little bit more, like, traditional-ish when it comes to Canadian wrestling. A lot more holds, a lot more grapples, a little bit more like that. Mexican wrestling does a lot more of uh, the gymnastics when it comes to it. They do a spectacular show, and then the entire bit in Mexican wrestling is always wearing the mask. 
because it's uh, Lucha Libre, you you are always wearing a mask. In fact, it's a whole disrespect of removing your mask and not wrestling with a mask when doing so in Mexico. A lot of the wrestlers in the 70s were either like, there's a good wave of uh, retired football players, either like not Hall of Fame level, but, you know, had a solid, like, good 15-year career, but, you know, this offensive lineman nobody really knows or this defensive lineman nobody really knows or something and then would go on to wrestle and then then that's what they would continue to do to make a living unless you really played your cards right you had to do something after football to make a living which a lot of guys uh pro wrestling end up being you know part of that way of making a living you have people who will do it like well damn near almost into their 60s so this is interesting, right? Because mm-hmm. the way that it plays is like any other televised sport then. Oh, yeah. Where the, but it's an individualized athlete, right? Wanting to be oh, yeah. the best. And so on their journey to be the best, well, they never really actually are because it's it's like a fictionalized almost sort of sport. Uh, what, what it comes down to is to the heel in the face. And if you're the face, you're basically the face of the franchise or the wrestling company or essentially, and that's why you have the belt. If you're the heel, you're the one people love to hate. And that's where the early pageantry of the entire thing comes out of wrestling when it comes to it. Because in the early days, that's that's what you would do to promote the entire thing. And then you buy a ticket, it would be, you know, for someone who's not really... uh, I'm going to see a Broadway show or this and that, you know, and not quite for a boxing match, but, you know, this has a storyline, this has this, and this has, you know, someone to throw my popcorn at and et cetera, et cetera. You know, that's where you went to a wrestling match. And then you have someone who's really theatrical about it being very good and very like over the top and, you know, egotistical about it. That's where you have a classic heel you have someone who's supposed to be like more pure, more like, you know, about the sport of wrestling and about, you know, that, that, that was your classic one. Well, what, what the old thing was, was kind of like a Saturday morning cartoon. Your, your classic face was your, you know, your classic hero, like He-Man, whatever it was, you know. And they would be your stereotypical hero. And I mean, hell, it even came down to... Hulk Hogan and you look at his stuff in the Hades I mean he was uh, take your vitamins go to sleep on time read your bible do your homework you know it's just like oh god get out of here with that you can see that result in the 90s because the 90s the hero was basically like someone like Stone Cold Steve Austin where he was flipping the bird drinking a beer down in on television well you know kicking his boss in the gut while giving him a stone gold stunner or something, you know, while threatening to get fired, but finding some loophole where he couldn't get fired. Eh, that was the best part of it. Where it was it was the age of the anti-hero when it comes to it. Or someone like Stone Cold or The Rock really climb. Uh, something that I've always been somewhat confused on is it mm-hmm. seems like pro wrestling is one thing, right? Mm-hmm. And it seems like the characters interact with the entirety of it. Uh, And that could just be from the outside looking in, but really there are multiple organizations of pro wrestling. uh, My understanding, like there's a SmackDown, there's a raw, there's the WWF, there's the WCW. Mm -hmm. How does all that fit into one big picture? Are they pretty siloed? Well, they, they all came about in their own way. I mean, really when it comes to it, I mean, hell WCW, a, basically come came out of the formation of wwf because ted turner wasn't allowed to really buy it from vince mcmahon because he wanted to make it on his own and then ted turner had a huge interest so he essentially did what vince mcmahon did and bought a whole bunch of little basically other wrestling stations what came to it and then basically formed what would become wcw at that point in time for vince mcmahon it was like I grew up in this business. This is the only thing I've ever known. I've literally got this from my father and then his father before him, you know. Vince McMahon came up um, around in the 70s or so. And then 
because in the 80s, he was actually 80s and 90s. He was an announcer on the announcer team, and nobody actually knew he was the owner of the, the entire organization. His dad was the one who ran one of the bigger uh, wrestling, uh, oh, God, one of uh, the uh, bigger wrestling organizations when it came to uh, WWF at that point in time. Vince uh, basically inherited it from him. And then he had what uh, money he had. He even borrowed some at some point in time through a lot of other uh, spots. And then one of his biggest acquisitions was one, getting Andre the Giant to wrestle in WWF. So he had that huge draw there. And then two, buying up a whole bunch of his competition at that point in time. And it was really the formation of what would be known as WrestleMania when it comes to it which was the biggest draw because it would always bring in huge amount of pay-per-view money. And one of the biggest uh, WrestleManias was uh, Hulk Hogan versus Andre the Giant. And that's the one, of course, where Hulk Hogan wins, and he wins by suplexing the then 500-pound Andre the Giant. Because usually when it came down to it, Andre uh, never never lost a match. And that was the first match he lost was uh, WrestleMania. And then there was this point in WCW's point in time where they just basically were buying off their top talent from you know Hulk Hogan. And everybody remembers the, the point of Hulk Hogan, even if they didn't watch wrestling or anything, of him being a thing. Macho Man, Ric Flair, all these top wrestlers. Brett the Hitman Hart was their number one draw at the point in time. They bought him off too as well. Because uh, one was like TBS, and then um, I believe WWF was at USA at that point in time. And it really became a head-to-head thing. They're two completely uh, different TV stations, but they were vowing for the same time slot. That would be that uh, like 8 o'clock Monday night. You have your own heels, your own faces, your own characters and everything else. And you get the bigger time, and either the character flopped or didn't. And you might have to retool something, or you might be better as a face when it comes down to it, or you might be better as a heel when it comes down to it. Because you had a point in the 80s where it was really high in popularity, but you really didn't have too much of a television option, especially not the way they do Raw nowadays, which is just every Monday for ever and ever and ever. Like the season, essentially, when it comes down to it, quote unquote, never ends. So in that sense, that's when it became, quote unquote, like a soap opera. You count on, you know, same people essentially, and then, you know, people move out, you know, your characters, et cetera, et cetera, except for there's a match in there. And then, and then you have the whole soap opera bits of I hate him, he hates me, et cetera, you know. Of course, in the 90s, it got extreme. That's when they got the better writing when it came out. That's when they got the better characterization. Because uh, part of the genius came from, um, like, uh, the original character of Stone Cold came out of ECW, a completely different company. And Stone Cold and ECW had a whole thing of just being basically against the, like, against the establishment when it comes down to it. They, they were a small company, and they made a thing about being a small company, but they, they were hardcore when it came down to the core of the, the entire company. And then Stone Cold really made a name for himself, and then they basically bought his contract, introduced that character, put him against essentially Bret Hart and even Shawn Michaels. But after the Montreal Screwjob Vince recognized who the greatest villain of all was going to be against him, which was going to be him himself. Actually, while we're on the subject, could you recap the story of the Montreal Screwjob in its entirety? Ooh, Montreal Screwjob. Well, that happened with, of course, uh, WCW buying the WWF talent. They ended up, uh, because Bret Hart ended up refusing the first offer of WCW because he had disloyalty to WWF. But the offer he got from WWF, which he signed and then renixed, which was basically an insult. And then they did not in, really end up caring for, uh, 
for our services at that point in time for, uh, in other words, to pay him what, uh, what he thought he was worth. And then WCW came back again, and then that's when he ended up signing that contract to uh, basically end out his time in WWF. And it was going to come down to one final show in Montreal, of course, which was going to be the last uh, match in Bret Hart's career. It was going to be him versus Shawn Michaels. And then what was supposed to be a win for Bret Hart between even him and the referee and the referee and him even talked beforehand to make sure like, hey, look, nothing funny is going to happen, right? And this was a ref he trusted every time he said something was going to happen. He was the guy to go to. But Vince Russo basically took the ref that was going to be the man in that stage beforehand and essentially told him that no matter what, Sean is going to win. So Bret Hart goes into the match believing, you know, he's going to win this match no matter what. He goes into the match. He ends up uh, getting to the point. uh, He gets the sharpshooter on him. Doesn't get, he gets out of the sharpshooter. And then he gets the sharpshooter performed on him, which is the finishing move of Bret Hart. He gets it done on him by Shawn Michaels. And he doesn't tap out or anything, but you see Vince McMahon ringing the bell, pointing to the ref, the ref saying that he tapped out and it was the same guy, et cetera, beforehand. Bret Hart immediately stands up, looks at Vince and starts yelling at him. Of course, uh, through uh, the television, they did not air whatever the hell he was yelling, but, you know, it was obviously not nice. And then he starts uh, spelling out the words with his hands, WCW, because uh, that's that's essentially where he's going next. So he's just like writing out WCW. And you see the camera in on him for this entire segment, which, I'm, you know, I always thought, like, why would you show that if he's going to go to a rival station that you don't want him to go to? Why do you want to advertise this? Because now we just want to see what he does on WCW. I just thought it was kind of stupid. And then he goes over to Vince McMahon and spits in his face right then and there. This all happened live on the pay-per-view at that point in time. And he storms off in the back. And then Shawn Michaels goes in the back. And he's a newly crowned champion, of course. And then he goes to Brett and says, like, look, I had nothing to do with it or anything. And he just uh, gave him a look like, like, I'm not buying it. Shut up. He goes to Vince's door and he goes to his office and Vince McMahon just is just hiding in his office. Essentially, he tried to even apologize backstage. He's like, look, I'm sorry, etc." And then he just punches him in the face because he tried to apologize, I guess, when he was in the shower. But Bret Hart didn't care because he was obviously pissed. So he just runs right out of the shower, butt naked and just basically cold cocks him in the face. Grabs a towel and then leaves the arena. (sighs) Butt ass naked. You see some of that after part on on the video. Go ahead. Would you say the Montreal Screwjob's like one of the most iconic moments of wrestling ever? Oh, definitely. Hell, the, uh, I forget the ref's name involved, but uh, every time he would do a match, every year he did until he retired, when he did it, you screwed Brett would be chanted every single time. And this, and we were talking for like 11 years. <laughs> and apparently it was not when it was supposed to go down that way. He ends up going to WCW, of course, and the title stays into uh, WWF. But what Brett Hart did was he went to a Canadian television program and then essentially gave away the entire thing which is what Vince McMahon or nobody wanted to happen. In other words, this all happened to like according to a story, you know what I mean? And what he did, which was never done before, which he revealed the whole KFAB, the entire situation. He revealed why it was fake, how it was, you know, was supposed to happen, what was supposed to go down, and that no, it did not go down. And then instead of like this moment burying Vince McMahon, Vince McMahon took this moment and that's where he really created himself to be the villain. He basically turned that whole hate and just centered it on him 
and then used him as the centerpiece in his own show. It's really kind of cool. He's the embodiment of, you know, any kind of shit boss when it comes down to it, which he really made himself out to be during that point in Raw, because he, he really put out Stone Cold to be the hero in the situation, especially with the beer and everything else that would be splashed on him. Right, so Stone Cold was kind of your anti-hero that everybody would rally around in the 90s when this thing was super popular. Who were his primary foes or nemesis, per se? Uh, especially, uh, well, first would be kind of Bret Hart, but then that ended with him going to WCW, of course. And then his major foe at that point in time was Vince McMahon. When they wanted him more on a, another wrestler, it would become like uh, eventually Triple H when he joined up with uh, quote unquote Vince McMahon to have the corporation going at that point in time, which was another group that formed, of course, but it was the establishment group and they all had suit and ties and everything. And Vince McMahon had Triple H there as his, you know, quote unquote, like bodyguard. Stone Cold being, you know, would always find a way around everything they'd come up with. And then, you know, the other one they would have, someone like that would be The Rock. The Rock is like if a shit-talking, like, athlete becomes like a, a wrestler. And then that's, that was that was his whole character. The Rock has his five hundred dollar shirt. The Rock has, and he would like describe everything he's wearing, how he's better than you, why he's better than you, and essentially why you're a jabroni. And he would describe the millions and the millions of The Rock's fans. <laughs> He'd always have to talk about himself in the third person, of course. He kind of worked that anti-hero because he was so good at being that heel. That the chance went from Rocky sucks to Rocky, which actually kind of drew him to where he is today. I mean, he just has that natural charisma with him that that he's so good at it. You know, he's doing a character and he's just like, you just can't help but love it. Yeah, we've had quite a few um, major movie stars recently uh mm -hmm. come from wrestling and i know that we have for quite some time though i i feel like the ones that when i was growing up they were still known to be wrestlers right like hulk mm -hmm. hogan was despite all of his reality tv and the fads of the 2000s he was still a wrestler you know same with anybody else who was on tv oh, yeah. people like the rock people like john cena even batista now are, are kind of coming out of those like they were once wrestlers, but that's not their identity, and now they're in movies, or now they're in shows, or we we follow them in other capacities as celebrities. They seem like they have full-blown transitioned. That seems to be something that I, I don't really see before The Rock's time, and, and correct me if I'm wrong. Did that happen a lot before? I mean, obviously, you know, you have... Well, yeah, let's talk about uh, Roddy Piper at some point. But, like, you, you have those <laughs> moments, right, where, where that would happen, but... It, it was uh, very few and far between. Like, um, because man, most of the acting skill that would come from wrestlers at that point in time were wasn't too well. I mean, you had some exceptions with uh, Hulk Hogan, and that was even still to a limited point. I mean, he was in Rocky Three, if I'm not mistaken, on that one. It was kind of funny because they had to do a whole angle between him and Hulk Hogan because Rocky is like five foot seven or something. And then Hulk Hogan is like six, seven. So just naturally looking at that boxing match is kind of a mismatch right off the right off the get go. But yeah, other than like Hulk Hogan, I mean, you had Roddy Piper, of course, and they live, which is one of the most classic movies when it comes to like that genre of science fiction movies in the 80s. And then it didn't have too much uh, between then, really, when it came to wrestling and acting. I mean, you had, because uh, it really was like Hulk Hogan after that. And then few and far between, mainly like made for TV movies or, oh, dumb series. And then all kinds of just stupid, like cheesy and corny things. The Rock is really the one that really opened that up for every other wrestler when it comes to serious acting at any kind of point in time. Although his first outing wasn't, I mean, really wasn't the best. I believe it was the Doom movie, which is uh, really on the cheesy side. 
but I mean, it, it could honestly have been worse. He made up for it. Yeah, I was gonna. I mean, you know, this is, tell John Cena's first couple outings were kind of just like, "What the hell's going on?" And now look, you know, what happens next? Where does wrestling go, or or is it just found itself, uh, and it just kind of continues at that scale? It kind of found itself and really kind of continue at that scale. I mean, Vince even uh, when he tried to start the original other, the original XFL, if I'm not mistaken, till that one failed miserably. That was the first failure of his entire career when it really came to it. Like when Vince actually bought the company when it came down to WCW, because it was a huge triumph for him because he'd won already. Uh, Got the established, like, huge amount of money from the 90s and the whole, like, Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock and then everything else that happened at that point in time. Merchandising, video games, et cetera, et cetera. Even got THQ to switch over, which was the top wrestling game maker at that point in time for any of them. And so he made a point, really, when it came to it, which I know was the best day of Vince's life. When it comes to like in wrestling to speak anyways, was when he got to announce on TBS of all places that he bought the competition's company. And how does Steve, how does Stone Cold kind of retire away? Um, what's like Stone Cold's final match in, in, in that way then? Or how does his career end? Well, honestly, he was just kind of off and on there because, uh, he had wrestled, when it comes to wrestling, it, it, it's a day in, day out job because not only will you do the Monday nights, but they will also do promotional stuff in between then. And that's a historical thing. And it'll be like Thursday nights and Sunday nights, they'll go to a spot and then they'll be taping somewhere else on that, you know, Monday. In between there, they'll like stop here, stop there and do a show, do a show. And, and they have done those shows like forever and ever and ever when it comes to it. But Monday Night Raw really added to the story element to that. So most wrestlers, when it comes to it, because even for those shows, you're still going to need someone like uh, like Stone Cold and Triple H. But they won't be, for those non-televised ones, they may show up, they might not show up, but it's like, uh, it, it's a good rest day for your main talent. It's a good, like, what can our, uh, you know, up-and-comers do, you know? But to make it interesting for everyone else, they'll they'll have a good like a good face show up once in a while. Do you have a favorite wrestler? Ooh. Well, growing up, hell, probably even still to this day, it was always between Stone Cold and The Rock. You know, when it came to it, just that perfect point of being fourteen and <laughs> having a wrestler that lips off people and drinks beers and doesn't give a damn <laughs> and the rock of course because uh oh this is the whole story of him starting down as a, a goofy like smiling guy to to a guy who was like butthurt about the entire thing but his whole like reaction to becoming butthurt became basically uh the greatest character ever in uh wrestling history <laughs> I don't know who Stone Cold Steve Austin is. That's no. awesome. That is the I, no. the I I don't know how to like let you know who that is. Sounds like a Google. I think I've seen this person's face before on something. Yeah, it's, it's been on like, you know, uh, for lack of a better word, like secular television. <laughs> He's probably crossed over once or twice. A lot of the superstars, I think, will. Oh wow, they they wear minimal clothing. Oh, you didn't know that? No. This is amazing. We Let's should see. just like. Oh, he's. Oh, he, I know why he's been in the Expendables. Oh yeah, he totally was. Oh, and the Longest Yard. Okay. And Grown Ups too. Okay. I hear Grown Ups Two is a good movie. Uh, honestly, it's pretty good. All right. Okay. So far, we got a we got one facial recognition. <laughs> I'm like the failing software. <laughs> oh my god! As a kid, were you ever 
like privy to the rock's mannerisms or iconic like trademarks like the eyebrow or the can you smell what the rock's cooking kind of talk to know who he was but you remember hearing those you just didn't know what they were from or anything like that i mean that was didn't me know and what those were anchorman either. for 10 years you didn't know yeah. those? okay <laughs> this really didn't cross over <laughs> no it didn't this makes me feel sheltered <laughs> so boys, I had no idea that there was something to do with the rock's eyebrow I always just thought he flexed it in like that recent Netflix movie he's in with um, uh, Gal Gadot I thought he just like you know would do poses like that because he just like enjoyed you, arching his eyebrow oh well you didn't pick up that it was like this iconic reference no that's kind of how it was like oh that's like an interesting camera angle i guess he feels the shot is you know it's like a good shot of his face like it's flattering like, that's cool <laughs> i mean completely in your defense this has been me for the last like 40 episodes on this show not being familiar with the source <laughs> material but this is true <laughs> that's hilarious it's that's my hilarious. turn to be you know essentially elf <laughs> fitting walking through and being like this is the world's best cup of coffee <laughs> okay but then it's like this teenage delve into into wrestling how does how does david get into this is it all like kind of like fan fiction like created like he's super into the what he sees on tv and it's like we should we should all do this in the neighborhood type deal i think so and the reason okay. i think so is because it's really easy to see sort of the end goal right and and to craft yeah. a story around that because you have these set rules you have heroes you cool. have villains and then you have the belt and everybody wants the championship belt <laughs> my character when we were doing PCW, which would be uh, our teenage championship wrestling when it comes to it right there, was uh, I was the grave digger. Uh, I was kind of, uh, uh, I, I would call it like a knockoff clone of The Undertaker. I was big and my nickname was The Big Show, but I didn't want to go as The Big Show. I, I went as The Grave Digger, so... I had the whole black uh, makeup under the eyes and everything else uh, to go with that. My friend Orion was the ice man. Oh, I didn't even know what his gimmick was, but he always had a do-rag and he always wore all black. He always had the same thing anyways. My friend Steven was the ass man, although he's more like Mick Foley meets the ass man. And the ass man was an actual character in DX that had these... Uh, these yellow like bicycle shorts with like little lips on them and steven had the same exact outfit he wrestled in it too martin i forget his name S mm, silo there we go silo i was more of a heel that, that that was my guy i was a heel but then like martin's character silo was even more of a heel like, our biggest face, I would say, was probably Andrew. But then everyone wanted to be heel anyways. Because like, we had a whole... We had a small group of wrestlers there. And basically, damn near everybody was a heel or was a face and then turned heel or was a, was a heel that turned face. We just had so many, like... Because there was no coordination when it came to, like, storylines or anything. So everything changed week from week from week from week. It was all funny. And we had a whole bunch of like uh, storylines that we went through, like <clears throat> yeah, like basic storylines. Uh, you stole the belt, and oh, like I'm too big league for this small league to CW wrestling, and then just like someone else would come out and like I had to show you some respect, I just smack the respect out of you, and then like all kinds of stupid stuff like that. Honestly, it was pretty fun. You basically got to live out uh, one of your guys uh, on television, basically made it your own a little bit, you know. And we would always have a little uh, kind of get together for it, too, when it comes to it, like food and everything else in the bag, and then get in character and then have like a little, like a rows of people 
not too many people will probably say about like 10, 15, 20 at most. It's a good number. Especially for a little backyard. I had a dumpster in it right next to it for some reason. <laughs> we used it. We did. <laughs> but we had it, everything planned out, all the moves we were going to do and everything. And what we were going to do, what was it going to be the result, and what was going to be the twist at the end and everything. I won a belt and I literally held it for like, I think, about a minute and a half until uh, I believe Martin took it from me at the end of the pay-per-view match. <laughs> and they played his music and everything at the end. We had the music. It was all my friend Andrew's backyard. Had a tarped away area we would all meet in. <laughs> Fortunately, none of us got injured. You know. <laughs> Disclaimer, probably shouldn't do it at home. <laughs> Obviously, since I'm learning about all of this wrestling now, I did not do any of that as a <laughs> as a youth. We did have the plastic lightsabers, and some were green, and some were like the Darth Maul ones that were like red with two sides. Yes. And that was kind of like guys you got the jedi you got the, you got the <laughs> you know? yeah you got yeah. the red ones threw some capes on and went on your way <laughs> i think this is probably the first time uh star wars has ever been compared <laughs> to, to wrestling but yeah you know just another transferable target on you. <laughs> I feel very uh, untapped. <laughs> <laughs> I, I honestly, I, I expected you to be more against it, but you were more naive to it. Yeah, I'm not like, you know, everyone has interests and I don't have to like them all. Like, no. This is one that does not appeal to me. Does not. Like, I love musical theater. There's a lot of people who feel very strongly against it's true. musical theater. That's true. So, you know. I can't be hypocritical. Right. I can just be regular critical. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, no, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's also fair that, like, I was in a household of, like, I mean, my mom's a Dodgers fan, so there's always baseball. But, like, other than that, like, pretty sports agnostic. But, like, you know, I didn't have to watch it. I could just go upstairs and watch <laughs> Hannah Barbera go to Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is what I did. So, you know, like that's that's fair. I was pretty much just like eh. so then they're like we're not going to try to market to you. Yeah, for sure just like wildly different demographics though, to be honest. That's just <laughs> it I think it's not. wild. I was not different. reached. <laughs> yeah. And that's it for this prime time party time. Big thank you to David Taylor for coming on tonight to share his love and knowledge of all things pro wrestling, from its history to its iconic moments, characters, and even his own personal experience with the sport. It was great having him on. And thank you for joining us. The show could not have been made without the following amazing people. Talking our artwork, it was done by Fen. Find her at Fen Latte on Instagram. Theme song was done by J. Wright. Find him at jwrightmusic.com. Website with thanks to Coco. This episode airs on Coco's birthday, so happy birthday, Coco. Happy birthday, Coco. Find episodes of Primetime Party Time on Apple, Spotify, wherever you like to listen to your podcasts. And catch us back here for our final Primetime Party Time coming right up here on ptptshow.com. How is that song still going? We went for a while, right? We go for a while. Yeah. I don't know. Did you learn anything tonight? Everything tonight. I learned. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot. There's a lot to this. A lot of gaps to <laughs> To amend my only other wrestling esque knowledge comes from 
Super Puzzle Fighter 2 Turbo, which involves Street what? Fighter characters. Oh, is that where the turbo comes from? Yeah, they, uh, <laughs> you line up gems like Tetris and they explode, and then your player gets their attacks that way. So it's like you're two and two games at once. It's very fun. Brings out both the best and worst versions of yourself. You <laughs> That's all good it's Highly games competitive. Too. Uh, because you can really like annihilate the other person by making like giant gems and then exploding them. Yeah, but and you can. Can you smash them? Oh, oh. And do like, you know, attack moves, like slam people into the ground. Or tables or chairs? I mean, sometimes too, they, they do have props or like just like magical powers, flames, different things that really could just take you out. But, you know, it's in like these, they're kind of also like chibi versions of the Street Fighter players. Like oh, they're no cute way. and they're like, you know, like miniature. So it's a fun time. It's very much a discontinued game. Oh, so it's always unfortunate. Uh, if anyone can find it, like do email me if you find my <laughs> contact information. But, uh, if not, Crystal Crisis on Nintendo Switch is very similar, and it's a nice free add to both of those games. One is just continued, so it can use all the love. The other one is probably uh, doing all right. <laughs> so I'm I'm sad I slept on the 2017 reboot that was also quickly taken off the shelf. So that's so unfortunate. I apparently, uh, you know, as much as I'm not reached for the demographic of this episode i was reached for this very specific video game audience <laughs> so i don't know what to say about that i don't know what to say about prime time party time getting into video games you know between this and castlevania somewhat oh that's right we did do we have a little we, we dabbled yeah we did we, we okay yeah we we, we do dabble we do dabble 